actually, yesterday afternoon, a couple of students asked me an excellent question. And it is, now, why are we doing all this? And now I regret that I actually didn't spend more time telling you why we do all this. Because sometimes I wonder myself. <laughs> so, the first point is, why do we do numerical relativity at all? Well, we do numerical relativity because we want to solve Einstein's equations. And of course, ideally you solve equations analytically, but analytical solutions only exist for some very specific examples, basically. Usually examples that have a high degree of um, symmetry, for example, spherical black holes or rotating black holes, but not for objects that we might be interested in from the perspective. For example, two black holes that orbit each other and merge. And for those, uh, for those objects, we need numerical solutions. So that's why we want to construct numerical solutions, and that's why that's why you signed up for this workshop. I will remind you. Okay. So now, of course, then there's the next question. So fine, we want to solve Einstein's equations numerically, but why do we have to go through this pain of all of this three plus one decomposition? And the answer to that question is, well, A, you don't have to, there are other approaches as well. This is one approach which has proved very useful. And why is it useful? Because it casts the equation in the form that mathematicians call it a Cauchy problem. And that is, that is to say, we, we want to cast the equations in a form where we, we split basically two parts. Basically, we solve the initial value problem. That means we, we solve a certain set of equations that will derive today. That gives us initial data, meaning it's the state of the gravitational fields at one instant of time. And then we'll have a second set of equations that tell us how to evolve these equations forward in time. Equations to tell you how those equations evolve forward in time. It's only the current equation that contain time derivatives of the electric and the magnetic fields. And by going through the 3 plus 1 decomposition, we bring Einstein's equations into a form that, in fact, is very similar to Maxwell's equations. And actually, we'll talk more about that on Friday. Right? But for now, so that's just a motivation. That's why we're doing this. Uh, so now we get back to this form of motivation. Um, it works. You all proved in the tutorial yesterday this is the following relationship. For the second derivative, covariant derivative of the vector, this was the projection gamma a t gamma t gamma c r of number p, number q, u, r, and then we have two extra terms, one minus epsilon k, a, b, gamma c, r, and q, number q, v, r, <coughs> minus epsilon k, a, c, k, v, p, v, p, and this holds for any spatial vector v, okay? Okay, now, let's use this to proceed in our form of derivation. Let's let me also remind you what are we what are we how are we critique we're proceeding this derivation. We said well we want to relate space-time quantities and space-time tensors to spatial and normal projection of these tensors. We want to relate Einstein's equations which live in space-time to uh, basically spatial equations and initial equations. We will do this by looking at projections of the Riemann tensor. Remember, yesterday we wrote down formally the projections of the Riemann tensor, and we realized there are only three different projects, projections that exist. Right? There's one projection that is purely spatial, there's one that contains one normal vector, there's one that contains two normal vectors, and we realized that any more would be identically zero because of the symmetry of the Riemann tensor. Okay? So now we have these three projections to deal with, and that's what we're going to work on. Now, why is this useful for that? Well, you remember that the Riemann tensor is basically defined in terms of the commutator of the second derivative of the vector. That's exactly what we have here, both here and here. So, and we have this here for the spatial covariant derivatives, here for the space-time covariant derivatives. So we can now use this to get ourselves the relationship between the Riemann tensors in those two different spaces. So how do we do that? Well, we start with the following. So now, I can write this, it's, I can write the spatial Riemann tensor as the following, dr, dc, dA, dd, and I 
just rearrange the indices a little bit from how we write it usually, that allows me to get an upper index on the D in a second. This is the same as 2 times D A D B V C. This looks slightly different from the form I had it in the black form before because I actually wrote out this commutator to two terms. Now I'm using this notation with this with, with the square brackets to uh, denote the anti-symmetric part of it. Okay? Now, now this is exactly what we have here. Okay? Except that I need to put square brackets around the AD. So let me write this up. This is the same as 2 times gamma AP gamma DQ gamma CR times the square P and Q and VR. And then if maybe I'll keep going, minus epsilon times A. A, B, gamma, C, R, and Q, another Q, B, R, minus epsilon, K, A, C, K, B, P, D, P. Do you agree? I hope you're checking all the indices for me. Yes. Sorry, what do I have to change? R, B, C, D, A, I'm making the bracket, but I'm going to be down. That's right, that's because I wanted to have this index up. Usually that index is also down, so I raise the index on, on the vector. Okay, that's all. That's all. Okay, that's all there is. Okay. okay, now, what is this term? Do we recognize this? That is a four dimensional. But now we take the anti-symmetric part. It's always such a joy to right? Yes, okay. And this part is left over. So now we can write this as the following. Okay, I can write this um, as R. Now I will actually lower all these indices. Okay, and I lower D by bringing that back up. So I have R, D, C, B, A, V, D, okay, equals gamma, A, P, Gamma BQ, gamma CR times 4R, DRQ, P times VD, minus 2, and there's our epsilon, KC, AKD, uh, DVD, right? And now I also realized. I did not tell you which particular spatial vector I'm doing this for. This is actually true for any spatial vector. Okay. So I can actually say this is true for any spatial index D. So therefore, I get the form. form. So this holds for any spatial DD. So we get the form we relate to. We have R, A, and I'll, I'll rearrange the indices to R, A, B, C, D so that they're alphabetical, it's always going to show equal plus. And now I'll also write out these anti-symmetric terms explicitly, so I have an epsilon A, A, C, K, B, D, minus epsilon A, A, D, K, C, B, equals, and now I need four projection operators because it's spatial, so I have gamma A, P, gamma B, Q, gamma C, R, Gamma ds 4 r p q r s right? Now let's put a box around this equation because this is a triangle. Um, that too has disappeared because of the anti-symmetric part. The anti-symmetric part is look. I defined it as one half a mm two. -hmm. Okay, so that's for the two points exactly. This is Gauss's equation. Okay. Now this is what we've been hinting at since Monday. Remember on Monday I set up this example in the tutorial where I told you take flat space, three-dimensional flat space. The Riemann tensor is zero. Now we take the sphere embedded in this. The Riemann 
is not true, how can that be? And now we see exactly how that can be. Here we have the, 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 the curvature of the embedded space. Here we have the Venus curvature of the embedding space. And they're related to each other, but they're the extra, extra terms. And that is the extrinsic curvature of the embedded space. So we see now how the intrinsic curvature of the embedded space, together with the extrinsic curvature, they make up the curvature of the embedding space. So in fact, let's go back to the example. Let's check whether this works out. And look, that's exactly why I ask you to work out what is the Riemann tensor of this sphere, because that's what we'll use here. Yesterday, as an example, I was, these friends are causing me some trouble here, but that's okay. Um, I also ask you to work out the, uh, the extrinsic curvature. So we can have, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Leave it to the oh, of course. Um, uh, so we can now check whether this works out. Yes. So let's do that. So for the embedded sphere. Well, you have it in your notes. Okay? And that was the following. So here's our example. Okay. Okay. The Reno A. That was 1 divided by r squared times, well, I'll use gamma for the metric on the induced uh, object. Okay, so this is j, gamma ac, gamma bd, minus gamma ad, gamma bc. Remember, we derived that on Monday. Yesterday, we also derived that the extended curvature, kad, was uh, minus 1 over r, gamma ad. So now we can insert both of those in here. What is epsilon for this example? We see, okay, and indeed, this term cancels that one, this term cancels this one. Indeed, this is zero as you, as you expect. So it works out be beautifully, okay? This is a triumph. We should celebrate this, okay? So we have, we set up this puzzle. Now we understand exactly what's going on, okay? So this is an example of how we relate the curvature if it's for me, tell them I'm not here, okay? Um, um, th that's how we relate the curvature of the embedding space to the curvature of the embedded space, all right? Now that is, what does this equation do? This equation gives us a relationship for the completely spatial projection of the Riemann tensor. This is the first one, right? We see that this is completely spatial. We have two more relations to deal with, one with one normal projection, one with two normal projections. In order to just save us ourselves some time, I will not derive those exactly. I think we've done really well in deriving this one from first principles, okay? We're, we're done with that. So the, the, the derivation of the other equations is very similar. We'll just outline the, 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 um, the, the proof and then we'll use the result, okay? So, uh, for that, I need this, yeah. So now consider one normal projection of Riemann. Okay, so what is one normal projection of Riemann? That would be something like this, gamma AP, gamma BQ, gamma C R and S and then 4 R P Q R S. Okay. Now let's just think about what this is. Well this term, okay, this term we can write as the commutator of N, right? So this is something like two times the commutator of P, uh, I'm sorry, P, Q and R, something like that, right? Now we notice, oh, this covariant derivative of, of N, that kind of looks like an extrinsic curvature once we have these spatial projections, right? But then we have this extra term here, so, and then we have a pr spatial projection of that again. So you can imagine that this gives us a covariant derivative of the extrinsic curvature. We have two of those terms because of the anti-symmetric part, and indeed what we get from this is the following. We get D B, the covariant derivative of K, A, C, minus D, A, K, B, C equals gamma, A, P, gamma, B, Q, gamma, C, R, and S, and then the 
our Riemann tensor PQRS. And there's our second equation. This equation relates the normal, the first normal projection of the Riemann tensor to covariant derivatives of the extended curvature. I usually refer to this as the Kodatsi equation. Even though these two equations are sometimes jointly referred to as the gauss kodatsi equations. Okay. Now we have one more step to do, and that is a projection of Riemann with two in two normal directions. And again, I will just outline what that, is, how we can prove that or derive that relationship. Okay, so this is how it works. So finally. We have two normal uh, projections. Okay. We have n, something like nd, nc, and um, I'll even skip the spatial projections, but r, d, b, a, c. Well, this is something like 2 and c, and now the commutator of c. A, oops, A times N B, something like that. Okay, and maybe I'm even missing messing up some indices here. Maybe no, I think that's roughly right. Um, but what you see is we again have um, this is this has to do with K A B, right? It's some type of X in the curvature term. This we can think of now as the gradient along the normal direction, okay? That, but that we can rewrite in terms of the Lie derivative along the normal direction. And in fact, what we get, okay, so this is related to the Lie derivative along the normal direction of KAB. And in fact, the equation that we get is the following. Um, maybe I'll write it down here. That the Lie derivative along the normal direction of KAB equals ND. NC, gamma A PQ, gamma BR, times the Riemann tensor DRCQ, minus epsilon divided by alpha, DA DB alpha, minus KCB KAC. Okay. And that's it. By the way, in proving this relationship, you need the identity that I asked you to prove in the tutorial yesterday, which rewrites the acceleration in terms of the gradient of the lapse. That's how the gradient of the lapse enters into this. Okay? This is Ricci's equation. Okay? And now, what should we do next, really? Well, we should try out this equation for our example again. Okay? But instead of me doing that here on the blackboard, I put that on the tutorial so you will have the joy of checking that this afternoon. Okay? All right. Now, where am I in my notes here? Oh, there. Good. Um, hmm. uh, where do we stand right now? Basically, everything we've done yesterday and today so far is pure geometry. There's no physics here, right? I've only related curvatures and measures of geometry, but I have not talked about physics at all. Okay? And in fact, I mean, basically, just look at the names. This is Gauss's equation, Kodatsi's equation. These people lived before general relativity. Okay? Even though Gauss actually had some very interesting ideas. He, I mean, he, he also was a um, surveyor, so uh, he did many things. Okay? He did many things very well including surveying. So he lived in Göttingen, in this German university town of Göttingen, and there were three mountains outside of Göttingen, so he climbed on all the three mountains and measured you know, the angles between seeing the others to check whether they in fact add up to 180 degrees. So he was curious, actually, do we live in a flat space? You know, little did he know that, in fact, no, but it's also space-time that is curved, not space. Okay, but anyway, um, so now what we'll do is we will take these geometric results, and now we'll insert the physics into this. How do we do that? Well, we'll take all of these results, but now we'll use Einstein's equations to write the Riemann tensor in terms of the 
the action and the curvature. That's, so we will insert Einstein's equations to get rid of this uh, the Riemann tensor of the, for, of the space time. Okay? All right, so how do we do that? Uh, well, we do the following. Let me erase something here. First derive the constraint equations. Okay. Now basically we're going to physics. Now we are really committed. We're saying, okay, we are considering space times. I really want to commit to spatial slices now. That means our normal vector shall now be time-like. Okay, so now we'll finally throw out the epsilon because we're done with this example that we've used it for. So now we'll say, okay, we'll use epsilon equals one from now on and we won't bother carrying that around. Okay? So let me, to derive this, the constraint equation, let me start with the Gauss equation. So start with Gauss. Okay? And let me contract that equation once with gamma AC. Now you have that equation in your notes. You can check what, that, what you get from that, but the result should be this. We get R BD plus uh, K BD minus K CD K CB equals gamma P R gamma BQ gamma DS times 4R PQ RS. Okay. Where I've introduced, where I have dropped a K, okay, which is the trace of the extended cur curvature. Okay. So, so where K is, this is defined as KAB, KAB, or I could write it as KA, KA. This is the trace of the extended curvature, right? So, trace of extrinsic curvature. Sometimes this is also called the mean curvature. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's our first result. Now, let me actually contract this once more, okay, with BD. So, let me contract with gamma BD. Then I get from the first term, I get the trace of this three-dimensional Ricci tensor, which is the three-dimensional Ricci scalar, plus from this term I get a k squared. The next term will be a k a b, k a b, if I rename the, the dummy indices. And that is the same as gamma p r, gamma q s times four, r p q r s. Do we all agree? Or rather, did I make any mistakes? Well, you will check my math. Okay. Let's work on this term on the right-hand side. We'll just continue this equation and see what we get. Okay. So to write this in a different form, I will insert our definition for the spatial metric. So this is G P R plus N P N R times G Q S plus N Q N S, and I obviously need a little bit more space here. Times the four dimensional Ricci tensor R P Q R S, right? Okay, now what do we get from that? First, I get basically what. What type of terms do I get? I get certainly a term from the two Gs, right? And if I do that, I get a PR that gives me the first pro projection that is the Ricci, the uh, Ricci tensor, but then I get a second contraction of that, so that will be the four-dimensional Ricci scalar, right? So this will be R, okay? Then I'll get mixed terms where I take this one and this one acting in that and these two. Will I also get a cont uh, contribution? contract with R? People are shaking their heads. Why not? Because this, because this is anti-symmetric in these indices, so that will go away. So we only have two more terms to play with, and in fact, I can collect them as, as 
twice the same thing, 2 times NP NR times 4 RPR. I can do that because of the symmetries of the Riemann tensor again. Okay, so now I have these two. Uh, now I can do the following. Let me write this as 4 times R plus 2 NP NR. And now I'll place the Riemann tensor there with the Einstein tensor. Okay, so the Einstein tensor was G, P, R, and now I have to add one half G, P, R times 4, R, okay, right? What do I get when I contract these two ends with, with a metric here? Minus 1, this was an exception, right? For once it's not 0, right? It's minus 1. So minus, then I also have a factor of two, 1 half times 2, which is known as plus 1, right? And so that will then cancel this term. So all I'm left with is this. This is the same as 2 times NP NR times GPR, right? You agree? Now what do we do next? We use Einstein's equations, right? Einstein's equations tell us, well, this is equal to 8 pi t. So this is the same as 16 pi, having trouble with this chalk, 16 pi times NP NR times T PR. Okay? So now we define this. Okay? What, what is this? So n is like a four velocity. It's the four velocity of the normal observer. But what do I get if I contract the stress energy tensor with the four velocity? I get? It's an energy density, but it's the energy density as observed by a normal observer. It is not the energy density as observed by, for example, an observer co-moving with a fluid. That's why we did distinguish those two. Okay? Next week, when Professor Nielsen is going to teach uh, talk about hydrodynamics, there will be an important difference, right? Those two densities, right? So we define rho, okay? I use just a simple rho for this, this particular density. This is NP NR uh, TPR. This is density as observed by a normal observer. Okay? Now we can insert this in here. We go all the way back to the left-hand side. And we have derived um, the so-called Hamiltonian constraint. So this we now have R plus K squared minus KAB, KAB equals 16 pi rho. Okay, this is the Hamiltonian constraint. This is called a constraint because it does not contain time derivatives of the metric, the spatial metric, or the extrinsic curvature. It just gives you a, a condition on what, what functional forms allowed for the spatial metric and the extrinsic curvature so that basically this slice fits into the embedding space. Okay? So that's why this is a, called a constraint equation. All right? Okay, let me erase this. This equation. Now we do the same thing for the Kodatsi equation and the Ricci equation. Okay? And again, I will just outline the, the derivation. Again, we, I think we've done a nice job deriving this exactly. Okay? We'll just outline the rest. So we, we just say that similarly, we get uh, from a contraction of the Kodatsi equation, we obtain the momentum constraint. Okay, which is this dB of K BA minus dA K equals 8 pi. SA. This is one way of writing the momentum constraint. It contains, just like the Kodatsi equation, covariant derivatives of the extended curvature. On the right-hand side, 
we now have a different projection of the stress energy tensor. This projection is the following. S, SA is defined as mi minus, minus gamma AB and C TBC. Okay? And this is the momentum density as observed by a normal observer. Okay? This is the momentum density. by normal observer, okay? Oh, maybe, maybe. We have one more equation to, to deal with, and that is the Ricci equation. We, but we can use the same kind of manipulations to, to derive that. And then we get the following. Finally, Ricci equation yields L, the normal lead derivative along the normal direction of KAB equals minus 1 over alpha, DA, DB, alpha plus RAB minus 2, KAC. KCB plus K, K, A, B minus A pi, and now we get an S, A, B minus one half gamma A, B, S minus rho. Okay, these are the matter sources that we get from the stress energy tensor, and these are the stresses as observed by a normal observer. We have S, A, B is defined as gamma A C, gamma B D, T C D. And I've also defined S as the trace of that. This is gamma A B S A B. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? All right. Now this, okay, we should put the, just for, out of fairness, we should put a box around this too. There we go. Okay. Now these two are constraint equations. They con do not contain any time derivatives, okay? This, th we're already done with those. This one is not a constrained equation. It actually contains something that looks like a time derivative because it contains a derivative in the normal direction. It means away from the slice. So this is one of our evolution equations, okay? Now, let's think a little bit more about this time evolution, though. Um, the question is, is it really a good idea to take this derivative along the normal direction, okay? Or should we take the lead derivative uh, along some factor times the normal direction? The reason why I'm bringing that up is the following observation. Basically, we've defined all our tensors in a spatial manner, right? Basically, we, we said we have some spatial hypersurface. We now project everything on that. Now, what we want is when we evolve fields forward in time, we also want to remain, we want spatial tensors to remain spatial, okay? In other words, when we have a vector along which we drag our vectors, we basically want all these vectors to end on the same next spatial hypersurface, okay? So, um, okay, but, it turns out that's not true for n, okay? And we can see that from the following. We could do the following. We could check out by how much does the label t, okay, our function t, right? The level surfaces of which define our hypersurface. By how much does that change when we go in the direction of n, okay? And we can work that out. Well, that is alpha times and am I doing that right? Yes, I think I am. Alpha times mi minus, the alpha comes from the NA, times GAB times um, a, 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 a nabla T, that is the N part, okay? But now I still have the nabla T, uh, a, T here, but now you recognize that this looks like the normalization of the normal vector, okay? 
And but that normalization gives us a 1 over alpha squared if you go back to your notes from yesterday morning. So this turns out this whole thing goes with 1 over alpha. Okay? So that means that basically this is general. This is not constant. Right? This could be different in different places. So if we draw a picture, maybe here's our spatial slice at one particular time. Okay, maybe here's the spatial slice at a time t plus dt. Then this means that our vectors will actually not all connect to the same point. Maybe this one ends here, this one ends there. Okay? It might be something like this. this that's not what we want. Okay? What we want is that our so-called time congruence that these vectors along which we propagate the fields all end up on the same slice so that on that next slice our spatial tensors are, st are still spatial. Okay? But this also tells us how we should do that. Instead of using n, we should use alpha times and we should just multiply this with alpha and guess what? The alpha will be gone. Okay? So instead of using n here, we should use alpha times n. Okay? And in that case, we get the following. Okay, so this suggests to us that we should choose alpha and a as the fancy word is time congruence. Okay, and then the picture would be this. Here's again my two slices. Okay, and now every vector will basically end up on the same slice, something like that. Okay, do we agree? Now what we want here is that this next slice shall be spatial again. Is this the most general that we can do? Or could I, could I actually say, well, why, why not take this vector as I just defined it, alpha n a, but could I not add another spatial vector to that? So I could add a vector here, for example, okay, that has to be spatial, right? But if I add this, then the sum of these two vectors will also bring me to a spatial slice. Eh? So I can generalize this and say, you know what? This is not the most general I can do. I can also add a new spatial vector, which I will call what? It's the shift vector. That is where the shift vector comes in. It allows us to move around spatial coordinates on these slices, okay? And then this sum of this alpha n and the shift, that will be the time congruence that I'll use, and therefore I'll call that TA, okay? So this will be TA, we'll use TA, so this is now more general, okay? We use t TA, this is alpha NA plus a beta, uh, 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 a spatial vector beta, which is the shift vector. And I'll come back to this picture in more detail in a little while to explain it in more detail. Okay? So we'll use this as the time congruence. Okay? So this now, pro it, it, this propagates, this vector TA propagates basic coordinate points, spatial coordinate labels from one point to the next point. Okay? So for example, if we have decided to call this point, give this point a certain name, maybe we gave it x equals 3.5. So, okay, then on this next slide, this point would have the same name, x equals 3.5, all right? So this propagates the, uh, the, the, the good points from one sh uh, slice to the next. That also means that a coordinate observer travels tangentially to this time congruence TA, okay? So this is tangent to coordinate observers. Okay? In the context of Newtonian hydrodynamics, we would call these guys Eulerian observers. Okay? And now we just have to keep in mind that we now distinguish between coordinate observers and normal observers. Normal observers are these guys. These are coordinate observers. Okay? All right. So now we want to rewrite this normal derivative in terms of this time congruence TA. But that's not, that's not too, too bad. Um, then we get the following. Then 
lead derivative along t of this. That is the same. We insert this definition of t into that, okay? And you can prove for yourself as a little exercise that this is the same as alpha times the lead derivative of n of kab plus the lead derivative of beta of kab, okay? And what is that? This is, now we insert basically our result for lead derivative of n of kab, which too bad I just erased. Okay, it was here a second ago. Okay, but we insert that. And then what we get is minus dA dB alpha plus alpha times RAB minus 2KAC KCB plus KKAB on KAB. All right? Does that make sense? Now, where do, you may have heard people say, saying that the two evolution, evolution equations. What might be the other evolution equation? Sorry? Yeah? Exactly. It is the lead derivative of gamma, right? We, it, but really, how, how do we introduce that? Well, they basically popped out of the definition of the extended curvature. So, d right? It, it, right, half, right? Minus half. <laughs> okay, so, um, so basically the other evolution equation is basically what we got from defining k, which related it to the time derivative of gamma. So we also have the lead derivative of t gamma ab. We will write this lead derivative of t exactly in the same way. And then we get minus 2 alpha kab plus lead derivative of beta gamma ab. OK? All right. Now, um, here's a little comment. You've seen yesterday in the tutorial, and I, I said that yes, yesterday morning, that we can evaluate lead derivatives either in terms of covariant derivatives or partial derivatives. Okay? Up to you, whatever is more convenient. Okay? In this case, for this term, when you actually code up this term, it's usually a good idea to write out this lead derivative in terms of partial derivatives. Okay? because you have fewer Christoffel symbols to deal with. This term, on the other hand, might be more convenient to write in terms of the covariant derivative. Why would that be? It's like because you're taking the first term would be the covariant derivative of the metric, which is identically zero. You already saved yourself one term. OK? OK. Um, why don't we take a really quick break now? Okay, just a couple minutes to wake up again, and then we'll go take it from here. Okay. Uh, maybe we should interrupt this duration for for a few minutes and, and just add some of these questions. All right. So somebody asked me, what do I mean by a coordinate observer? Okay. So a coordinate observer is somebody who basically has a trajectory through the space time, but this observer would always be at a fixed location in terms of the spatial coordinates, okay? So let's say this observer at some instant of time notices, oh, I'm standing here, I have coordinate labels x equals 5 and y equals 7 and probably some z also, okay? Or it might be r equals something and theta is something, you know, any coordinates. Now as that, as time moves on, as basically this world line goes through these different slices, at each instant of time, that means at, on each slice, that observer would still be at the same values of, that, of those coordinates, okay? So that's what we mean by a coordinate observer. That observer traces out a world line in our space-time diagram. This world line intersects these different spatial slices, okay? On each spatial slice, the spatial coordinates are the same, okay? And if we now drew the uh, 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 tangents to this world line, those tangents would be aligned with our time vector ta, all right? Those are different from the normal vector because we are lying for the shift vector. The normal vector is defined by being normal, as the name suggests, okay, on these spatial slices. But the coordinate observer is allowed to move around with respect to those normal, to that normal vector. And actually, I will, I'm trying to get to a point where I draw that picture again when we've collected a few more things and actually everything's, I think becomes a little bit more intuitive, okay? Now, anything else that we should discuss right now that will clarify things that we've covered this morning? Yes?
Yeah. And then write down the equation. Right. The thing is, whenever we project something on a hypersurface, we might do some information. That's right. That's exactly, yes. You do that if you only consider the projection onto the slice. That's not what we've been doing. We've considered the projection onto the slice. That gave us the Hamiltonian constraint. But we also considered the projections along normal. Okay? And by using all that information from all the non-trivial information from all projections, both spatial and normal, that gives us the complete equivalent set of equations. Okay? Right? Yes? Okay, that question I'm trying to set up in, on my next page or two, okay? Because that's how, the, that's how we'll get the time derivative, okay? The lead derivative, we'll write the lead derivative as a time derivative, and that'll, that'll be clear, okay? Uh, so just, my question is why those two, the time derivative of those two quantities? Okay. Okay. Okay, this is why, uh, yes. Look at Einstein's equations. What, what type of derivatives of, does, do Einstein's equation in, in their four-dimensional, in, in a space-time form, what kind of derivatives do they have? Well, they have up to second derivatives, right? Now, um, those derivatives are both in space and time, right? So that means that Einstein's equations have up to two time derivatives of the gravitational fields, right? Now, what is, what is K? K is by virtue of the equation that was roughly here a few minutes ago, okay? Uh, it's basically the first time derivative of the spatial metric. The spatial metric is related to the space-time metric, okay? So K gives us the first time derivative, but we know that Einstein's equation must contain a second time derivative. Where is the second time derivative? It's in the time derivative of K, okay? So the time derivative of K, that's basically where the second time derivative of the metric is buried, and that's why we need the two of them. In effect, what we've done is we've rewritten a second, a, a, an, equ an equation, a differential equation that is second order in time into a pair of equations, both of which are first order in time. All right? And that's, again, that's much nicer to integrate numerically than a second order equation. All right? Anything else? I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Yes? Okay, yes. I, 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 I still didn't understand the question. I'm very sorry. The gradient of A, T, and M, J. Yes? You write M, A, and get of A, T. Covalent derivative of A, T. Okay. Um, <laughs> I apologize. My problem, not yours. Okay. okay, but I do not understand. What is A, T? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The gradient of t. Yes, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. These two are in the same direction. Yes, correct. Correct. So we're measuring how much does the label t advance as we're going in the, in the n direction. Okay? And if we just use n, we notice that it advances at different rates in different points. Okay. Which is not what we want. Normalized. Sorry? And it is not normalized. It, it, well, it's normal, but it, it, the vectors don't end on the same next slice. Okay? Yeah. Right? So I think actually several of these questions will be clearer if we go through the next few slides. Okay? So because the point is the following. So far, I have not committed to any particular set of coordinates. All of this is completely coordinate invariant, right? I have not told you yet what, how we choose our coordinates. I have, in, in, in the very beginning, I told you we'll consider these hypersurfaces, these spatial slices, as level surfaces of some function, okay? And I gave that function a name, I called it T, okay? And I told you, well, at some point, we will choose that t to be our time coordinate, but we'll keep that a secret for a while. We pretend we don't know that yet, okay? Now I'll share some news with you. We'll choose that t to be our time coordinate. So, we'll, no, in other words, now we'll choose a coordinate system in which, in fact, each 
hypersurface corresponds to one value of our coordinate time. Okay? So we'll actually choose that t to be our coordinate time. So then we get the following. So, so far, the coordinates are completely general. Okay? What we'll now do is we'll choose Okay, so to begin with, we'll choose three spatial basis vectors. Okay, and now we'll choose them that, in fact, our basis vectors are tangent to the spatial slices. So that means our basis vectors themselves will be spatial, okay, which so far I've not assumed. But now we'll make that assumption. Okay? So we'll choose three spatial basis vectors. And I'll call them E, E, I, okay? Okay, so that uh, these are vector, the vectors have indices A, but these uh, I in the parentheses, they denote these three spatial components. Yes? When we choose the lexicon equal to one, if we only choose the surfaces of constant time, what? So say it again, if, what? We chose the lexicon equal to one. So right. No, what it means is that by setting epsilon to 1, I've committed to myself to normal vectors that are time-like as opposed to space-like. But it's not, I have not chosen a coordinate yet. Okay, I could choose various different coordinates and, you know, that where the coordinate time may or, not, may, may or may not align with the spatial slices. But now I'm going beyond that. Now I'm saying now I actually want my coordinate time to be aligned with these spatial slices. Okay, and that I, do, I start by saying I want three... Basis, spatial basis vectors where this indices i, those now cover only the spatial parts. They go from 1, 2, 3. i is 1, 2, 3. Okay? And um, I choose these so that the, these are spatial. How can I guarantee that? Well, the dot product of these basis vectors with the normal vector must be 0. Right? So I want to make sure that Na EIA equals 0. Okay? That gives me, so the i is the, the name of these basis vectors. So for example, the i could be ex, ey, ez, or it could be er, e theta, e phi, okay? So it labels the three, your three spatial basis vectors, okay? Um, now that gives us three basis vectors. We need four, okay? As the fourth basis vector, I'll use our congruence ta that I defined a few minutes ago, okay? so so. TA as the fourth basis vector, okay? TA equals EA zero. And now in our coordinate system, in this coordinate system we're choosing, the basis vectors are basically just deltas. They're one, zero, 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 so zero, zero, one, zero, or something like that. So this one will be zero, one, zero, zero. 0, right? Okay, that is, we now choose this as our basis vector. We've identified this as our natural time congruence. Okay, now what do we learn from this? Okay, so now basically we can pop through a whole set of relations and find out things about all these quantities. Okay, I will, let me call this equation 1. Okay, what do we learn from 1? Well, the, the normal vector dotted into, the spati into any spatial tensor has to be 0. Okay, so that means that basically the only, since the dot product has to be zero, the only component that can be non-zero in, in this normal vector is the time component. All others has to be, have to be zero, right? That's true, but that's true, important, only for the lower, lower indices, okay? So from one, we have ni equals zero, okay? So these are the spatial indices only. Another way of putting that is the only non-zero component of the downstairs normal indices is the time component, right? The, these now label, the, the i is labeled only spatial components, but they're zero, okay? Also, if I take any spatial tensor, okay? With upstairs indices, I notice that it's only the spatial components can be non-zero. The, the, non, the time component has to be zero. 
How do we see that? Well, from the following. For any spatial tensor, so for example, let's say a vector VA. If VA is spatial, then we know that the dot product of VA with n must be 0, correct? But we know that the only component of NA, lower component that is non-zero is time zero, that means the time component of this one has to be zero, right? So we know that NA, VA, this has to be zero, right? But we know that all the spatial components of this are zero, so the only term that is left over is the N0, V0. That means that this component better be zero so to guarantee this, okay? So we, we, from this we have that all upper components um, have to be zero. So the upper time-like component of any spatial tensor has to be zero, okay? Or putting it differently, only the spatial components vi can be non-zero, okay? What do we learn from that about the shift vector? Well, if I write the shift vector with upper components, then this tells me that the T component has to be zero. That means I only have spatial components left over, and I can write it like that, okay? Now, what does it tell me about the normal vector? I already have this about the lower indices, but how about the upper indices, okay? Well, the normal vector is Na, okay? Now, we can use the definition of our time congruence to solve for Na. This must be 1 over alpha times Ta minus beta A. But we know what Ta is. Ta is just 1, 0, 0, 0, right? We also know that beta only has spatial components. So we know that this must be 1 over alpha times 1 for the time component and minus beta I for the space components. You with me? Now, we know that the space components of the lower indices components of n are 0. How about the time component? What do we know about the time component? Well, that we can figure out from the normalization of n. We know that na, na equals minus 1, okay? But the only non-zero contribution from the lower indices is the time contribution. So this is also n0, n0. But, we, yes? Yeah. But uh, uh, this uh, T and N has only time components. Um, All the spatial components of N is zero. The, the lower components. Lower components. Important difference. Okay. So we, that's true for the lower components, not for the upper components. Okay. All right. But this and and A with the upper component, we just zero zero. Okay. Okay. Now. Um, Now we can construct a metric, right? Because from GAB is, gamma AB is GAB plus NA and B. But we know that the only non-zero non components here are, is a time-time component. So we know in particular that all the spatial components must be the same, okay? So we realize that, oh, for all the spatial components, which I write as IJ, we have gamma aj equals gij, right? Now, we also found out that all upstairs time components of spatial tensors has to be zero. Gamma is a spatial tensor, so we know that all upstairs components that have any time component must be zero, right? So we know, also, we know that gamma A zero for, in, for any A must be zero, okay? So then we can write the following. We can write for the inverse metric, the inverse space-time metric. This is gamma AB minus NA and B. And now we can write this out because we know that we get a contribution from gamma 
only for the space components. For all others, we only get contributions from this, but we already know what those are because we just worked out what Na is. So this, it must be minus, for example, the time-time component for a TT. This one is zero. We get a one over alpha for each one of these. So this is minus alpha to the minus two. For uh, the mixed space time components, we get an one and zero, one and i, and that gives us an, an alpha to the minus two beta i. We get an right. uh, alpha. Does that make sense? Now I can write down the metric itself, not the inverse metric, but the metric itself. I can do that by inverting that metric. And if I invert that metric, that is a little bit of work, but you can do it. And what you find that, okay, uh, the, uh, is the following. And actually, we use, we will actually use the lower components of beta i, which we can get by from lowering the index of the index beta with the upper i, to use that to invert equation two. I'll call that two to find uh, uh, G A B equals minus alpha squared plus beta L beta L then beta I beta J gamma I J and I hope you, you, you I hope this notation makes sense to you basically this is the time time component this is these are the time spatial components so these these are just the spatial components okay or if I wanted to write this out in, in, as a line element, then I can write this metric now in the following way. Or ds squared equals minus alpha squared dt squared plus gamma ij times dxi plus beta i dt times dxj plus beta j dt, okay? Now, where does the alpha dt squared come from? That comes directly from this alpha squared. You also notice where this gamma xij comes from. That comes from these contractions, okay? The beta i comes from the mixed, mixed terms, okay? For example, that one with that one, that one with that one. The one that you might be puzzled by is, wait, didn't I forget this one? That is the one that you get by taking th th these two terms, the t squared terms, okay? This is sometimes called the, the space-time metric in the ADM form, okay? So this is so-called ADM form, where ADM stands for Anuit, Desna, and Misner. Desna and Misner, okay? Now, if you think about this, this is kind of like a space-time Pythagorean, okay? What do I mean by that? Well, we've kind of separated the dt squared terms, okay, from the, the other terms. So we could think of this as the following. A space-time Pythagorean theorem, okay? And actually, maybe I need a little bit more room for the picture. And earlier you asked me about what is this? Yes. Oh, p this this one? No. Okay. D d uh, dxi, right? Okay. Yeah, dxi. All right. I'm not sure. Was that the answer to your question? Yeah. J. Oh, I see. This is J, right? This, th these are I's, which are contracted with these I's. These are J's, which are contracted with those J's. Okay? Yeah. All right? So now earlier today, you, or you, you know, half an hour ago, so you asked me about this, what is this coordinate observer? What is all of this? So now is a good time to draw another space-time diagram, you know, a, a picture and show how all of this works. So let's imagine we have one slice here. This slice corresponds to some time t. Okay. Let's consider another slice up here, um, maybe like this. 
This is the time t plus dt. Here's the normal vector. Okay? And maybe this normal vector pierces through this upper slice. Okay? So it comes out here. Okay? Okay? It goes through like this. So this is the normal vector Na. Okay? It's normal on this slice. And you know, maybe this has tilted a little bit, but we, we imagine this all microscopically, infinitesimally, so this is still normal up here. Okay? Now, this is the normal vector. We decided not to take the normal vector as our time congruence, but alpha times the normal vector, okay? and in fact, times dt. This now gives me basically a vector that points from this point along the normal to a point on the next slice that is separated by dt. So this vector is now goes to here. That's our vector alpha and a dt. Okay? Now, we, we, I also said, well, we will allow for a shift vector that is spatial. So we now attach a shift vector maybe like this that is spatial that moves our coordinate labels over with respect to beta. Okay? So this vector is um, beta i dt. So what that means is maybe I have a certain coordinate label x i here. Okay? So as I said, this might be x equals 7.4. Okay? That means that this point, which has been shifted with respect to the normal, has the same label x i, x equals 7.4. Right? Now this vector is our t a. Okay? So this is t a. This is our coordinate vector, okay, TA, all right, that's, that's a TA DT, rather, okay, all right, so basically this vector carries us from one point with certain coordinate labels to the point on the next slice with the same coordinate labels, which has is shifted with respect to the normal vector. Now imagine I want another point, maybe this point, okay, and uh, this point now has different coordinate labels. It has coordinate labels, say, xi plus dxi. Okay? That means I have another vector in here which has components dxi. Now I could ask, well, how can I measure the space-time distance, okay? the proper distance between this point and this point? Okay? Well, I can use this metric, or I can use it in this form I, if I want to. And what it is, it's, based, it's like a Pythagoras. Remember, Pythagoras tells you about diagrams with the right angle? Well, here's your right angle, because this is a normal vector. So I can measure the distance along the normal vector. Okay? And then I can measure the distance in this direction. Right? This, what is this vector? Well, this vector is the sum of our beta i dt and the dx i dt. So this vector is now beta i plus, uh, I'm sorry, beta i dt plus dx i, right? You agree with me? So now, how do we compute this, the space-time distance, the proper distance between these two points? I take this distance, but this distance is basically alpha squared times dt squared, right? Because the length of n is 1 or strictly minus 1, that's why we pick up this minus here. Okay? Here is your alpha squared dt squared. This is the distance along this one. What we're missing is now we have to add the square of this purely spatial distance, which is this distance. Correct? But what is that distance? Well, this distance will be the shift, beta i dt, plus the coordinate distance. So now I have to compute the length of this vector. But that, I, I, how do I compute the length of a vector in my spatial slice? Well, I do that with my spatial metric. That's what the spatial metric is for. That's what we do here. Gamma ij times this vector times that vector, right? So this is the square of the spatial part of this distance. This is the square of the time-like distance. Does that make sense? Beautiful, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Why don't, yes? Is the voice having an accent because it can be applied by the way given Say it again. I, I have a hard time hearing within us. Is the voice having an uh, accent to curvature can yeah. be applied by the voice theorem on that? Which theorem can we apply? Uh, this space time by the way. Oh, it, well, it's a, well I, I mean, 
I put quotation marks around this to, 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 to save myself, okay? It's, I mean, this is suggestive, but really it is true. I mean, that this is really what it is. It's, it's the square of the time-like separation and the square of a space-like separation, okay? Or really the square of the normal separation and the square of the space-like separation, okay? Okay. What I suggest is um, that we do a little example, okay? Yes? I cannot hear you. I'm sorry. Speak up, because, please. Uh, you just, uh, to get that distance, you yes. just be beta i, b t plus b x i. Right. Uh, right. Because this is a vector. How do you add vectors? Okay. Well, it's tip to tail. Right? So you, here's a vector, there's a vector, the sum is that. Okay? We, you add them by component. Okay? Yeah. Um, let me just see how much... Actually, we're... Almost, I think I can actually finish this. But let's do an example quick. Um, okay, you have all of these relations in your notes, so I think I can erase this. Let's come back to an example that we also introduced on Monday in the tutorial, and that was the Schwarzschild space-time expressed in isotropic coordinates. Okay, so Schwarzschild in isotropic coordinates. We had ds squared equals minus 1 minus m divided by 2r divided by 1 plus m divided by 2r squared dt squared plus 1 plus m divided by 2r to the fourth times dr squared plus r squared d omega squared, okay? And now, basically, I wrote down the metric, okay, in, in this ADM form, and now we can just match terms, okay? And maybe I should have left it here. We, I had it here a second ago. We can just match terms, and from that, we can immediately identify, we can check, okay, okay what is the term in front of the dt squared, okay? It's just this one. This must be the square of the labs. So we can immediately read off, oh, that, the labs is just the, the square root of that. Okay, so we see, aha, alpha equals 1 minus m divided by 2r divided by 1 plus m divided by 2r. Now, what you notice is you have not seen this. This is not the first time you saw, that you're seeing this. I asked you to compute this yesterday in the tutorial. You also remember, yes, it was still a lot more painful. Right? Because I, first you had to set up the normal vector, then you had to normalize the normal vector from the normalization, you got the labs. Okay? Now, by having actually explicitly worked out what form does the metric take in this formalism, now we can identify very quickly and it's much easier. So we can immediately read off, this is the labs. Okay? You already knew that. Okay? What is the shift? Zero, right? as always except if it's minus one, but anyway, so, it's, it's, so this is, the shift is zero, there is no shift, there is no mixed space-time uh, component here. What is the spatial metric? Well, it's just this part, right? We can immediately read that off, and it, it, so the spatial metric is one plus m divided by two r to the fourth, and if I can now write it as one r squared, r squared, sine squared, theta. Now also, yesterday in the tutorial, I asked you to compute the extrinsic curvature, right? And remember, we did this little song and dance and we figured out, okay, what are the covariant derivatives of n and which ones have uh, space-like components and whatnot. And finally, we concluded it must be zero, okay? Um, in a minute, as you, I'll show you that k is zero much quicker. But before we do that, let's go back to our equations, okay, briefly and uh, do the following, okay? So, aha, uh -huh. actually I almost skipped a page. Um, now I'm more in doubt whether we'll be able to finish this. Uh, and maybe I'll do this. We, from having chosen these coordinates, okay, we now notice the following. Basically, in, when you go back to the constraint equation, for example, but any of the, any of the, the equations, and the, the constraint equations and the evolution equations, 
you have many summations over indices. There's contractions over A's, contractions over B's, right? Whenever you have a contraction, you have one index down, one index up. All of those, we've written all of those equations in terms of spatial tensors, okay? That means in every one of those contractions, you know, we will have to add over indices that go from zero, including the time component, over the spatial components. But every term that includes a time component will have a time component that is upstairs. But the time component of an, the upstairs time component of a spatial tensor we've learned is zero. So that means that now that we've chosen these coordinates, we can skip all the time components in those terms, and we can limit all summations to purely spatial indices. Okay? So that, that means we want to rewrite the equations now, but now we can truly restrict everything to spatial indices, and it's, everything will be sp purely spatial. Okay? So this is the, the two important consequences. Okay? One is we can restrict restrict indices of spatial tensors to spatial indices. Okay, so in other words, what I mean by that is our time, space-time indices, which I've denoted with A, B, C, D, and so forth, we can replace them with space indices, which I denote with i, j, k, and so forth, okay? All right? Also, by the same argument, we can compute the covariant derivative of tensors, the spatial covariant derivative, from purely spatial Christoffel symbols, okay? So we can compute the covariant derivatives uh, from so for example, di vj, we can now do this from as partial i vj plus vk gamma i, uh, 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 j, I'm sorry, j, i, k, where there's no longer a four in front, front of the Christoffel symbol because we can now compute these Christoffel symbols where, so gamma <coughs> i, j, k, or j, yeah, i, j, k, is computed from directly the spatial metric, no longer the, 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 the four-dimensional metric. Remember, before we defined this covariant derivative in terms of the spatial projection of the space-time covariant derivative, okay? But now we, that we can do this, we can directly compute these from i, j, k equals one-half gamma i, l partial j gamma l, k plus partial k gamma lj minus partial l gamma jk. And I'll ask, you, you, we'll work on that in the tutorial today, okay? So that means we can now express everything purely in terms of objects that we can compute from spatial objects, okay? And that, actually, if I can take a couple more minutes, is that all right? Basically, that's the interest gained from the breaks that we've been taking, something like that? Uh, anyway, let me just, basically when we do this, we can now write the constraint in evolution equations in the following form. We can restrict everything to spatial quantities, and then we get, we get, well, sorry, get this. Okay. So then we obtain the so-called ADM, the Arnold Beza misner equations. Okay. And we'll see that they split into two types of equations. They're, con they're the constraint equations, okay, which hold at every surface. And there's this r plus k squared plus k. And now we only sum over the spatial indices, k i j, k i j, equals 16 pi rho. This is the Hamiltonian constraint. And we also have the momentum constraint, di k i j minus, I can write it in this form, gamma j k equals 8 pi s i. This is the momentum constraint. And then we have, sorry? 
you know, I think, I think you're right. Okay. Okay. Um, then we have two, thank you. Then we have two evolution equations. Okay. Which evolve the fields forward in time. One is partial T gamma ij equals minus 2 alpha kij plus di beta j plus dj beta i. And this is where we've used the Lie derivative of gamma ij along beta using the covariant derivative so that the first term goes away. Okay. And then I get the last equation, which is now the, uh, the, the evolution equation for kij. That gives me alpha plus rij minus 2 kik kkj plus k kij uh, minus di dj alpha minus 8 pi al alpha times sij minus 1 half gamma ij. This is a little bit lengthy. Pl plus, is it plus a row or minus? So that I forgot right now. Is it a plus? No, minus. OK, then my notes are correct. That's good. And then I have the Lie derivative of kij along beta. And I can write this out as in partial derivatives if I like to, plus kik um, partial j beta k plus k, uh, kj partial i beta k. Okay? And this completes the set of, uh, is, is, is a set of ADM equations. Okay? So now we've written the, the constraint equations as this. We've written the evolution equation as that. There's one more step that I skipped here. Okay? <coughs> and that is, you may ask, but wait. A minute ago, this was the Lie derivative along t. And now it's the partial derivative. How can that be? Okay? And well, how can that be? But remember, our ta in this coordinate system is now just 1, 0, 0, 0. Let's evaluate the Lie derivative along a vector that is just constants. Well, then all the derivative of the constants, they go away. And what we're left over with is just a partial derivative. That's the beauty of this, OK? So now we have these partial derivatives. And that comes back to your earlier question, where you asked me, but wait, why, where do these time derivatives come from? Well, here are now our time derivatives. This is the first time derivative of, of gamma. That defines k. So k is based the first time derivative of the metric. Then here's the first time derivative of k, which gives us the second time derivative of the metric. That's how it all hangs together, OK? This is very similar to Maxwell's equations, right? It's exactly the same structure. In fact, we'll talk more about that on Friday. But in Maxwell's equations, we also have two constraint equations, which constrain the field at each instant of time. Okay? They, t they, 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 they give us conditions. We cannot choose E and B arbitrarily. Likewise, we cannot choose the gravitational fields arbitrarily. Okay? But then we have a second, sec second set of equations which tell us how the fields evolve forward in time. That those are the curl equations in electrodynamics. In this case, it is these equations. They tell, uh, tell us how gamma ij and uh, kij evolve from one slice mm -hmm. to the next. Okay? Now we've completed the derivation of these equations. And now we will play with them in the, in the rest of, for the rest of this week. Tomorrow, we'll talk about how we can solve these equations, how we can cons solve the constraint equations to get initial data. On Friday, we'll talk about the evolution equations, and we'll talk about ways how we can solve these equations, some issues that are associated with those. We want to st study the evolution of gravitation fields. Okay? This is a great place to stop. I thank you for letting me take an extra few minutes to, to wrap this up, but this, this is a great stopping place. So. Yeah, I'll see you later. Thank you.